Good evening. We are so glad that you are here for this special time that we have with Bishop Scott Jones. Um, I wanted to um, give you an idea of what the night looks like and some of the instructions. And then once I do that, Pastor Emmanuel is going to come up and lead us in our opening prayer. So um, in just a few moments, Bishop Scott Jones will come and provide a time of information sharing, um, 20 to 30 minutes or however long the bishop chooses to speak. It is his time. Um, and then during that time, you all have index cards, and if you need more, there will be myself, Pastor Emmanuel, and, and uh, Pastor Henry, and others who are walking around with index cards. The way we're going to do this is uh, Bishop will, will speak. You all have index cards. That's the way we will do questions. So write one question uh, on each card, only one question per card. And then we'll be sorting those to make sure he does not get asked the same question 16 times. So um, just write on the index card your question. All questions are welcome. We're not going to screen them and, and say yes or no. Just going to categorize them so that they get asked uh, one, one question. So um, that's the way we'll do that. So if you need more cards, just raise your hand. Again, we'll be walking around to, to help assist during this time. Um, I think that is it. Um, Pastor Emmanuel, if you'll come and lead us in our opening prayer. I invite you to pray with me. Holy Spirit, you are the reason for this season. You are the reason for this gathering. So come and preside over our conversation tonight. Come and lead us to be the church that you have called us to be. We thank you for the gift of life. We also want to thank you for the gift of our bishop and his leadership as he had availed himself to be an instrument of blessing unto us, we pray that you may bless him tonight, that he will engage us in ways that lead us to love you more, that we may love one another. We pray for the spirit of peace, your peace which passes all understanding, to attend to our gathering tonight as we seek to learn as a church family, and also as members of the larger body of United Methodist Church. Bless us with the spirit of listening and help us to also listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit that we may know the kind of church and the kind of people he is inviting us to be. We pray for those joining us on Facebook that your peace may be with them. Above all, God, bind us together with cords of love that cannot be broken. It is in your son's name we pray. Amen. Also to let you know that those who are watching live stream uh, Facebook, uh, your questions are welcome as well. We have someone monitoring our site, so uh, type in your questions and we'll get those answered as well. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Well, good evening, friends. Welcome. I'm glad you've taken some time to be a part of this conversation this evening and appreciate your interest in the questions that we're going to be talking about. As I said to somebody earlier, my spiritual gift is teaching. And to have an audience is a blessing to me. So thank you for coming and being willing to listen. My wife, who is here tonight, will tell you that there is a downside to that. I'm used to you teaching for a whole semester. I can talk for a long time on this stuff. So I've got an outline to try and stay disciplined, but mostly to set up questions that you might want to ask, and we'll take every question we possibly can. Friends, our church, the United Methodist Church, is undergoing a split this year. I deeply regret this. It is breaking my heart. I've been a bishop for 18 years, and I've been doing everything I know to prevent this. And yet, a number of forces have pushed us inevitably 
to this situation today. And it's important that you be informed about what's going on and what are the options that each United Methodist local church has. My commitment, which I've been expressing for three years now, is to help every local church find where it can best serve Christ and to have every clergy person who's part of our denomination determine, determine where he or she can best serve Christ. Uh, I know that there are some of our churches that are clearly progressive. They are committed to full inclusion of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and queer persons. And they chafe under the restrictions that have been part of our church for 50 years. There are other churches that are clearly traditionalist. And while they welcome LGBTQIA plus persons, uh, they're not going to do same gender marriages and they don't want gay clergy being appointed to them. There are also a lot of churches that are divided on this issue, and they flourished while the rules are in place, but they have a lot of conflict about decisions that need to be made. Friends, I have friends on both sides of this issue, respected colleagues who are going to end up in the two different churches. That's what makes this so hard, is the breaking of relationships. Now, two things have happened this year, <clears throat> this calendar year, that means that the split has started to happening now. First, uh, the general conference, which was scheduled for September of this year, has been postponed yet again. For those of you who don't really know the deep details about how the United Methodist Church is organized, our church is governed by a general conference. It has 862 voting members. Half of them are clergy, half of them are lay, we bishops preside, but we don't get to vote or speak. Roughly 40% of the general conference is from outside the United States, Africa, Europe, and the Philippines. The general conference writes our book of discipline, the rules that I, as a bishop, have to follow and enforce. It was scheduled to meet in 2020, but because of the pandemic, it got postponed and then postponed again. It was scheduled for September of this year, and that meeting has now been postponed until 2024. Because they could not get any answers, because the conflicts and disobedience by bishops and clergy and conferences have been increasing, a group of traditionalists responded to this delay by saying, we can't wait any longer. These traditionalist United Methodist leaders decided it was time to form a new Wesleyan denomination that would carry forward a lot of the values of the United Methodist Church, but would also be a fresh expression of the Wesleyan movement. They call it the Global Methodist Church. Now, we here in the Texas Conference, I need to give you some background for where we are in all of this. Your church belongs to the Texas Annual Conference, which is a group of 606 congregations around a quarter million lay people, 1,200 active and retired clergy in 58 counties, stretching from Texarkana to College Station to Matagorda and over to the Arkansas and Louisiana lines. In 2019, no, in 2020, we adopted principles of disaffiliation. We knew that there were churches that wanted to leave the United Methodist Church, and we wanted to have some principles that would govern how that happened. The General Conference, which met in 2019 in a special session, passed rules, and especially a paragraph 2553, that said how a local church can leave the denomination. Our conference principles implemented that paragraph, and since that time, five churches have left our conference. One to join the Free Methodist Church, one to join the United Church of Christ, and three, to become independent. Now that the Global Methodist Church has officially formed, and it is an option that people can, ex can join, we're holding district meetings to explain to people what the procedures are, what the options are, and to give them information. Our conference has a website, txcumc.org, and on that, there's a uh, page called the Future Discernment Task Force page under the heading Navigating the Waters. 
that gives lots and lots of information that can put into writing a lot of what I'm telling you tonight, but also give you some other information that might be useful. Paragraph 2553 <clears throat> basically says that if a local church wants to leave the United Methodist Church, there are some steps that have to be followed. There has to be a period of discernment. We've defined that as 40 days long minimum. Could be longer than that. Secondly, a local church has to pay all of 2021's apportionments in full, both conference and district, all of 2022's apportionments in full, and the, conf the lo local church's share of the conference's unfunded pension liability. The good news is, well, I don't know if there's any good news about rising interest rates and mortgage rates, but what its impact is on the, this issue is that the unfunded pension liability has now gone to zero. So basically, if you pay your apportionments and complete the process of discernment, and your church votes by at least a two-thirds majority of the professing members who show up at a church conference, then you can leave and take your property with you. The last step is that the approval has to be granted by a vote of the annual conference. I'm calling a special session of the annual conference for December 3rd. There will also be another one in the regular session, May 30 and 31 of next year. That paragraph that I'm talking about, paragraph 2553 in our Book of Discipline, expires at the end of next year. What this means is that a local church that wants to consider leaving the denomination has a window from now until June 1st in which to exercise that option. After June 1st, there's no clear pathway for a church to leave. So one of the things I've been saying in these district meetings, and so far I've attended eight of them over the last six weeks, is the question is, does your local church have to decide? And the answer is no. You don't have to consider disaffiliation. You don't have to have a discernment process. You can ignore this whole thing. That's your choice. But as in so many things in life, not to decide is to decide. In other words, if you choose not to consider this, what you're in fact doing is basically saying, we're gonna stay in the United Methodist Church and follow through with whatever it decides when the General Conference finally meets in 2024. I think there are four basic options that local churches can consider. One of them is to leave the United Methodist Church and become a non-denominational or independent congregation. I strongly advise against this. We've had some churches do that, but I'm telling you that over the next couple of decades, it's a death wish. Local churches need to be connected with other local churches. It's important for the recruitment of clergy. It's important for accountability. It's important for shared mission as well as thinking through important issues. When a church goes off on its own, all sorts of crazy things can happen and we can document how some churches that appeared to be very, very successful in the short time die over time because they don't have that denominational structure for support and accountability. That's why I advise against it, even though it's an option. A second option is to join another denomination. We, as I said, we had one church in Katy join the Free Methodist Church. A progressive church here in Houston joined the United Church of Christ. There are other options. You could become Episcopalian. You could join the African Methodist Episcopal Church. You could join the Disciples of Christ, uh, the Nazarene Church. If any of them will have you, then you could consider joining that denomination. I'm neutral on that option. There are advantages and disadvantages to every one of those denominations, but at least you're connected. The third option that churches have is to leave the United Methodist Church and join the Global Methodist Church. <clears throat> this new denomination has a website, www.globalmethodist.org. They have a book of doctrines and discipline that's completely online, and you can read the 100 pages, and 
that'll describe a lot of their procedures and rules and values. Their mission statement is, our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ who worship passionately, love extravagantly, and witness boldly. It will be a traditional expression of the Methodist movement. Its doctrine will state that Christian marriage is only between one man and one woman. They will still have bishops, but they will not have a trust clause. Each local church will own its own property, free and clear. They will have lower apportionments because they won't have nearly as much overhead. It's hard to predict exactly what the Global Methodist Church will be like. The upside of a new denomination are all the positives of doing a new thing. The downside of a new denomination are all the uncertainties of doing a new thing. For nearly five years, I was pastor in Prosper, a town north of Dallas in Collin County. They were taking farmland and turning it into one-acre tracts, and a lot of couples were moving out of the city and building their first home on an acre of land. Several of those couples, while I was their pastor, said, Preacher, we ain't never doing that again. Our marriage was tested and couldn't stand going through that process another time. Lots of decisions to be made in creating something new. Lots of compromises. Dreams that don't get materialized. In other words, the idea of creating a new denomination looks exciting until you get down into the nitty gritty of making some choices and figuring out these people aren't all that I thought they were. And so the new Global Methodist Church, while it has a lot of excitement behind it, also has a lot of uncertainties as well. Your fourth choice is to remain United Methodist. Its mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. I'm convinced that over time it will become a more progressive denomination. But how far in the progressive direction it goes and how quickly that happens, that's uncertain. It's pretty clear that they will indeed change their doctrine to say that marriage is between any two people and that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered persons will be accepted for ordination and then appointed as pastors. The people who are advocating for this continuing United Methodist Church are very clear. They want it to be a big tent church where traditionalists who believe in traditional marriage teaching will feel welcome and feel protected. The trouble is they haven't explained to me how those traditionalists will have a protected space in this new denomination. The big tent means they're also going to be welcoming liberals to the place. And so the conversation about whether or not you can discriminate according to same sexual orientation or gender identity becomes an interesting debate that will continue to focus the attention of the leaders of that church. What I've been trying to explain to people is that when you change the doctrine of a church, the discipline or rules follow that. Think, for example, about the change that happened in the late 60s around segregation. Methodism made up its mind in the 1960s that they were no longer going to tolerate segregation and they were going to actively combat racism. That doctrinal change came through to where we have a number of rules about how welcoming our churches have to be of, of people of different ethnicities, about how clergy are appointed. You all have an African pastor as one of your staff here. We do that all the time in the United Methodist Church. Well, we need to understand that when you make a doctrinal change, it flows through, and everything connectional begins to fall in line with what the doctrine states. Those changes will take time, but indeed, when I say the United Methodist Church will be moving in a progressive direction, those doctrinal changes, which are widely expected in 2024, will then be filtering through the rest of the system over time. Now, some people are wondering, how did we get here? Well, one starting point is the General Conference of 1972. In 1968, the Methodist Church joined with the Evangelical United Brethren Church 
and formed the United Methodist Church. Four years later, they rewrote their social principles. And the social principles adopted that year addressed the issue of homosexuality because the gay rights movement was beginning to take off and make proposed changes in the United, in the United States. The social principles from 1972 on have said, the practice of homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. Homosexuals are persons of sacred worth, and all persons, including gay and lesbians, are entitled to have their human and civil rights insured and be welcomed in our ministries. That's been our teaching for 50 years. But over time, we also clarified as a church that our ministers are not to conduct same-gender marriages, such ceremonies can't be held in our churches, and self-avowed practicing gay and lesbian persons cannot be ordained or appointed as clergy. Every time the General Conference has met for the last 50 years, these issues have been hotly debated with high levels of passion and conflict. Then in 2015, the United States Supreme Court, in the Obergefell versus Hodges case, legalized same-gender marriage in all 50 states. This major change in American culture increased the pressure on the United Methodist Church to change its doctrine and discipline. But the General Conference said no in 2016. Instead, they formed a commission on the way forward, which brought three proposals to a special session of General Conference in 2019. That special session voted for the traditional plan, which kept our current teaching. Now, it was a close vote. But the one church plan, which would have changed the doctrine and allowed for ordination of LGBTQ people, uh, was defeated. <clears throat> However, back in 2016, the Western jurisdiction of our church elected a lesbian woman and consecrated her as bishop and assigned to her as bishop of the Denver area. When the Judicial Council, our Supreme Court, ruled that such a practice was uh, disallowed and had to be corrected, the Western jurisdiction simply ignored the church's teaching. Since 2016, a number of annual conferences have openly set policies to ordain LGBTQ persons. They have gone ahead and done so, and in some cases appointed them to be pastors. So that I've been teaching people that the immediate cause of this split is the disobedience of bishops, pastors, conferences, and others to what the Book of Discipline says. Now friends, when I became a bishop, I took a sacred promise to uphold and enforce the Book of Discipline. There is no disobedience in the Texas Annual Conference. On the other hand, when bishops decide they're not going to enforce the discipline, there's very little you can do to hold a bishop accountable for that person's disobedience. You say, you ought to be able to fix that Western jurisdiction problem. Well, we have a regional section called the South Central Jurisdiction, which has the ability to hold me accountable if they choose to do so. And they're the ones that elected me and assigned me and told me I was moving to Houston six years ago. Well, in the, if your jurisdiction isn't going to enforce the discipline, there's nothing anybody in a different part of the country can do. There are many people on the progressive side of our church who are upset that General Conference has been postponed because they think that in the next meeting they're going to change the church's teaching and rules. But it was the conservatives who said, we are tired of fighting about this. They know that the progressives are not going to leave the church. They said, it's time to quit fighting and do something different. Hence, they decided on May 1st to form the Global Methodist Church. Now, friends, we in the Texas Annual Conference are trying to help local churches be informed. We're a diverse conference. We have progressives who really want the discipline changed. We have conservatives who have been fighting any kind of change like that for 50 years. Our group in our conference has come together and we're providing you unbiased, accurate information on our conference website. But 
Within our church, there are lots of different caucuses, organized groups trying to shift the church one way or another. So that if you go on the internet, you can find a lot of people expressing their opinions and their views on all of these issues. These caucuses and organized things are part of Methodism because we're a democratically based church. They go back to the 1820s, there have been such groups. Back in the 1820s, they didn't like the existence of bishops at all, and so they were organizing to get rid of bishops. We're still here. But some people have made various steps in between, but that gets into the history lecture that Mary Lou doesn't want me to give you tonight. <coughs> in terms of today's caucuses and groups, on the progressive side, there's the Reconciling Ministries Network, the Liberation Methodist Connection, the Methodist Federation for Social Action, UM Next, Affirmation, and a group here in this conference called That We May Be One. On the traditional side, there are groups like Good News, the Confessing Movement, the Wesleyan Covenant Association, and United Methodist Action. You can find their newsletters. They'll be happy to take your money. They'll be happy for you to listen to their videos. Um, they are an interesting source of information. You just need to be aware that they might have a certain bias. I don't control the channels of these other groups in the way that I have influence over our Texas Conference uh, website. But this is a time to listen to all of our sisters and brothers, wherever they are on this spectrum. Now, we in the Texas Conference have our principles of disaffiliation. We're providing you with this information. Your district superintendent, Elijah Stansel, will help your church go through a discernment process if your church council votes to start it. In other words, we need some elected leadership group to say, it's time for such and such a church to begin the discernment process. We have guidelines for how to do that well, but we think that's an important conversation that needs to go on among the lay people of the church. Now, friends, you also need to know that every pastor, every clergy person who's part of our conference also has decisions that she or he needs to make about their future. What I try to tell people is, this is really about how best to serve Christ. Quite frankly, I think both the GMC and the UMC are good options. We need a traditional expression of the Methodist movement, one that will continue to enforce and teach and practice traditional views of marriage, welcoming LGBTQ people, but setting certain boundaries on that. At the same time, we also need a progressive expression of Methodism because there are a lot of people who want a fully inclusive uh, church that will welcome and affirm lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, and queer lifestyles. I see that God could use both of these expressions going into the future. Unfortunately, the decision point is now, and you need to be aware of what the trends are and how things are going to be working out. So figuring out where you, your church can best serve Christ, what your mission field is like, and what the values are that your church wants to do, you can stay in the United Methodist Church, and frankly, that's the default. You still get to use the cross and flame, but you will be buying into however the denomination moves in a progressive denomination, in a progressive direction. On the other hand, you can join the Global Methodist Church <coughs> and figure out how you want to be a part of that creation process. I have made the decision to retire December 31st. My grandchildren are in Plano, Texas, and quite frankly, there were decisions about when I had to retire that had me on a roller coaster, and when it looked like I was retiring August 31st, there was about a two-month period of time when that seemed to be the do dominant thing. Mary Lou and I bought a house in Dallas, eight minutes from my, two of my grandchildren. Um, so that I'm working hard to finish strong as your bishop, to help set the stage for local churches to do the work that they need to do. People ask me, what are you going to do in retirement? And I said that for years I've said to my retired clergy, there is no retirement from discipleship. So I've told people, I expect to be doing something for Jesus. 
I'm just not sure where or whether anybody will pay me for that. Now, do you remember when I started this presentation that I said my heart was breaking? This is really hard. I did not want to do this. But it seems to be inevitable and inescapable for me, unfortunately, for churches that are affected by this. What I've been trying to teach in this process is that we need to keep an attitude that, well, it won't come as a surprise for those of you who've heard me speak, that I go back to one of John Wesley's sermons on this matter. In a sermon called Catholic Spirit, he said that while we are all in agreement on essential teachings, there are matters of opinion in the Christian life on which it's inevitable that Christians are going to disagree. On those matters of opinion, when we disagree, can't we love each other? In fact, what he specifically said, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike? May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? Without all doubt, we may. I hope for any conference, district, local church, Sunday school class, family that goes through this, we go through it with respect, careful listening, but most of all, loving each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord. That's my goal, and yet it's not going to be easy. So, Lyndon, I will now open it up for questions. If you've got some ready for me, Friends, I'm spending way too much time on these issues, but the benefit of that is I'm pretty well informed, and so if you want to uh, ask questions, now's the time. This is not the only ones. If you think of one, you can just raise your hand and somebody will, will help you with that. Let me get a quick bit of water and then we'll launch into this. A few, okay. What does it mean that the Global Methodist Church has been formed? Who is overseeing this? The Global Methodist Church has a transitional leadership council. Uh, I think it's 22 people. They have elected a president named Keith Boyette, who is a, used to be a United Methodist clergy person in Virginia. And they are the ones that are guiding everything about the Global Methodist Church. It's incorporated, uh, it is tax exempt, um, and within various conferences, uh, there are people who are um, helping shape the, ex the local expression of the Global Methodist Church. A pastor named Bert Palmer, a senior pastor of Kingwood United Methodist Church, and he is the leader of the group here in the Texas Annual Conference that is laying the groundwork for what things will look like after after. January 1st. Does the church have to vote? If not, what does that mean? You do not have to vote. Doing nothing means you remain United Methodist. And when the general conference meets and whatever it decides, that will be binding on you all. Staying uh, United Methodist means you are still part of the Texas Annual Conference and very little will change in the short term. Is there a deadline to decide on whether we want to go through discernment? The deadline is that discernment is at least 40 days long, followed by a 10-day uh, announcement of a church conference and then a church conference. So let's say you have to start the process 60 days in advance. Your last shot is May 31st. You've got three weeks of legal paperwork ahead of that. So let's say you've really got to start this process no later than March 1st. Um, on our website, there are timelines with these deadlines that will help you do it. Now, could there be a new opening for something to happen in the fall of 2023? Maybe. But that depends upon the new bishop. It's up to the bishop to call a special session of annual conference. Uh, and I've committed to that for this December. The new bishop may or may not do that for the following December. 
How does the voting process work? Is there a quorum? Will it be at one meeting or some other voting process? Every year, you all have a charge or church conference. The difference is a church conference has, uh, allows every professing member to vote. So, uh, frequently when I was a pastor, I was beating the bushes, please come to the church conference. You do that usually in the fall, you set the budget, you elect your officers, uh, the pastor delivers a state of the church report sometimes. This would be a special church conference. Every, you have to give two announcements about it, uh, at least 10 days in advance, and every professing member has the right to vote if they show up. No proxy voting, no remote voting, only those who are physically present may vote. And uh, in this case, the clergy do not get to vote. Only professing members do. The quorum is whoever shows up. So that for those of you who are in the legal profession and you worry about quorums at various entities, in this case, a United Methodist Church conference quorum is as whoever shows up that night once it's been duly announced. Using the quadrilateral how to illustrate how we arrive at truth. Who in the support of the historic view can demonstrate how scripture, tradition, reason, and experience each supports the historic view of the church on homosexuality? Um, that's a much longer discussion that I don't want to get into tonight. There are lots of books that have been written about these things, uh, both on both sides. There are people who have a uh, what I would call a high view of the authority of scripture uh, that say uh, all of the references to same gender sexual uh, behavior are negative in the Bible and that the church for uh, almost since the time of Jesus has said homosexual behavior is inappropriate. On the other hand, there are people who emphasize reason and experience and say, wait a minute, we now know because of modern science that uh, homosexuality is something people are born with, it's a sexual orientation, and we need to provide an appropriate way for self-expression of that sexual orientation within the limits of uh, Christian teaching. That's the very brief summary. There are books, lots of them, that you can read. If any one of the other denominations will have you, what does this mean? To join another denomination requires an application process. I talked to the Free Methodist Bishop before Grace Fellowship and Katie changed. He said, Scott, we don't want all of your United Methodist churches here. So Grace applied, had a, a temporary apprenticeship, and then was accepted. That's what it means. The other denomination might not think you're a good fit for them. In your opinion, will the UMC be more inclined to change the Book of Discipline to affirm same-sex marriage after the 2024 General Conference? Yes. Since we all struggle and fall short of God's image, how can we in the future UM denomination provide a safe haven for the LGBTQ community as they struggle with same-sex attraction? That's something we've been working on for the 50 years that our church has had this teaching. Uh, I hope every United Methodist Church is welcoming and loving of LGBTQ persons. The question is, do you uh, allow for same gender marriages and ordination of practicing uh, people in, this, in these categories? That's the issue that we're facing at this point. Uh, we're all sinners. We all struggle with various sins and issues. Uh, it's just that these particular behaviors are now being discussed openly as things that people want to affirm or not affirm. Uh, and that's been going on since 1972. What will the disaffiliation process likely to look like after December 2023? There is none. At the moment, the only disaffiliation pathway expires December 31st of 2023. There are some who believe the next general conference will in fact create or recreate a disaffiliation process. 
but I've been going to general conferences since 1970, and it's a little hard to predict. Why hasn't the United Methodist Church enforced the Book of Discipline concerning the documented past instances of appointments of homosexual bishops and performances by clergy of same-sex marriage and actual preaching homo practicing homosexual clergy? Again, I go back into history. In 1939, there was a merger of the Methodist Protestant Church. Those were the ones who didn't like bishops I told you about earlier. The Methodist Episcopal Church, the northern branch, and the Methodist Episcopal Church South. In order to bring those three denominations together, white Southerners insisted that bishops be elected and held accountable by regions of the country. We are in the South Central jurisdiction, basically Nebraska to Texas, Louisiana to New Mexico. There's a southeastern jurisdiction, a northeastern, a north central, and western. It was a racist, seg uh, sectionalist approach by white southerners. These are my people. My father's family was from Kentucky, okay? We did not want black people or Yankees telling us how to do church here in Texas. And so you create a jurisdiction, and nobody in this jurisdiction can hold somebody in another jurisdiction accountable. Well, as the western part of the country and the northeastern part of the country have become more progressive, and their bishops have begun ignoring the discipline, there's nothing anybody in our region can do to help that. Yes, the Judicial Council has sent rulings. I have to tell you, Mary Lou's oldest sister was a federal appeals court judge, okay? Serious. When you're a federal appeals court judge, you have United States Marshals at your beck and call, right? I once entered her garage without telling her, and she was calling the Marshals on me before Mary Lou said, no, 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 it's just Scott, don't worry about it. Well. The Judicial Council of our church has no marshals. All they have are bishops. And if the bishops say, we're not going to obey, there's no enforcement. One way of talking about this is that following the Book of Discipline is a covenant. And we all agreed to follow it. But when you don't follow it, nothing happens if you're a bishop. Um, and that's the way the things have been for the last 10 years. Adam Hamilton from Kansas and John Stevens from Chapelwood have advocated for staying in the United Methodist Church, even for traditionalists, because they claim no church or clergy will be forced to perform same-sex weddings or accept homosexual LGBTQ pastors. What guarantee is there now that would be the case? Is there one? Adam and John are both friends of mine. I've been John's bishop for six years. I was Adam's bishop for 12 years. I've asked both of them, tell me how this is going to work to actually protect traditionalists who stay. I've yet to be given an answer except trust your bishop. Sorry. <coughs> is it reasonable to assume no new bishop supportive of disaffiliation will be appointed? So churches seeking disaffiliation should move quickly before the 24, 24 General Conference. Um, friends, I think I told you my first General Conference was in 1970. I was 15 years old. I've been watching this process for a long time. The people who count votes the best tell me that there will not be any more traditionalist bishops elected in the United States. I don't know how they predict that, but they're certainly looking at the 2024 elections, and that's the widespread perception. Uh, I don't know whether what will happen. Those are all speculations, but I'm here with you tonight, and somebody asked me, so I'm telling you how I see it. Um, that one just said, what will it look like? I'm not sure what the rest of that question was. Maybe it was starting a different question. 
When a church enters into a time of discernment, does this require the church to vote at a charge conference? No. Uh, the discernment process can help a church talk to each other, uh, realize, oh my heavens, we don't want to do this. Uh, we're too divided. This is going to cost too much emotionally or missionally. And so part of the discernment process is for people to say, we don't want to do that. Um, right now, out of 606 churches, 230 in our conference are in a discernment process. About 13 have now held their church conferences. Um, we don't know how many will actually hold a church conference until the discernment process is done. What are the advantages and disadvantages of voting on discernment in May versus December? Um, the advantage of voting in December is that you're looking at 21, 2021 and 2022 apportionments. If you wait until May, you're also looking at 2023, an extra year of apportionments. The other factor is that um, the principles of disaffiliation will not be changing because they've been adopted by our annual conference. And we believe that the new bishop is not going to be changing those prior to the vote of the annual conference next May. Uh, so there's a sense in which having the discernment next spring uh, is just as good uh, as, as doing it in December. Um, partly, I've, I've talked to some pastors who say, you know, we've already started looking at this. We want to get this over with one way or the other. And so the December has the advantage of not dragging it out any farther. Partly, the pastor and church council need to talk to the district superintendent because your district superintendent, Dr. Stansel, has to approve your discernment process. Uh, every church is different, and if it's a larger church, it might take a long time to get everybody talking. Uh, one advantage, I've got a church up in East Texas with 11 members. Uh, they did it in the minimum amount of time and just decided they were going uh, that way. What is the fear, the theoretical worst case scenario of a more progressive United Methodist Book of Discipline? Um, it depends upon your viewpoint about sexual orientation and gender identity. One of the fears is that if you don't become more progressive, then all of those people who have gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered family members won't want to be at your church. And if you're trying to reach a group of people who are on the progressive side of these issues, Changing the discipline is an advantage because now you can advertise we are fully inclusive. Some of our churches are putting uh, rainbow flags out in front. Uh, and so when you do that, you can. <coughs> if, on the other hand, you are opposed to those kinds of changes, then the fear is that belonging as a traditionalist, belonging to a denomination that makes the newspapers for uh, gay clergy or marching in the pride parade downtown or uh, having a transgendered uh, person as pastor. Um, you know, those are things where your brand, the group that you belong to is there. The question sometimes gets, a point, gets asked, will we have a gay pastor appointed to us when we don't want that? The answer that's appropriately given is that in every case, the bishop and the cabinet, in the person of your district superintendent, consult with your staff parish committee, and we do, in fact, bend over backwards to match the pastor's gifts and graces with what is the need and perspective of a local church. Um, at the same time, if the Board of Ordained Ministry ordains 15 LGBTQ pastors as elders in the church, they're going to be appointed someplace. 
And so uh, eventually the question is, will churches that don't want a gay pastor get one? I, I can't promise that won't happen. In the same way, quite frankly, that some churches have said, we don't want a woman pastor until I send them a highly competent woman pastor. And they say, you should have done that before. Um, those are the kinds of questions that, that have to be asked. But those are the fears that sometimes are mentioned by people. What does the discernment process look like? Is there a plan with dates, times, education, curriculum, voting rules, et cetera? Who gets to make those things? Uh, the discernment plan has to be approved by your district superintendent. And we have a guideline, a, a document on our website called a period of local church discernment with a lot of suggestions. Sunday school classes might spend a ses session on it. There might be town hall meetings. You could invite the bishop on a Monday night to come and talk to you. And if you don't like what the bishop said, you can invite you know, somebody who's got either a very liberal or very conservative perspective to come talk to you. Um, you can show some of the videos that are on our conference website. Uh, Adam Hamilton and John Stevens recently did a uh, seminar both here in Houston and I think up in Lufkin uh, that was trying to explain why staying in the U United Methodist Church was the right thing to do. Show that to people. Um, it depends upon the size of the church and quite frankly, how much diversity of opinion is there? Uh, some of our churches are so unanimous, they don't need a lot of that. Others are more divided and they need a lot of talking in order not to tear everybody apart. Uh, so we're offering options and the leadership of the church, church council, board of stewards, uh, your pastors, they're the ones who figure out what that needs to look like. A common talking point is that this is about more than the theology of LGBTQIA inclusion, but it's also about adherence to the rules. Which rules? If those rules are solely around the issue of LGBTQIA plus marriage and or ordination, then isn't it disingenuous to say it's more than about this issue? Uh, there are people who say <coughs> it's partly about obedience. Um, there are churches that are deliberately withholding their apportionments in protest on these matters. Uh, there are also people on the conservative side who say this is all about doctrinal issues because when you have such a big tent church, you're also going to be making space for people who deny the resurrection of Christ and the divinity of Christ. Um, and so there are people who say that this is partly about our basic beliefs as a church, and they quote some very liberal uh, bishops and clergy who, you know, are sort of off the charts uh, on, those, on those issues. Um, at the same time that John Stevens and Adam Hamilton are very orthodox on those doctrinal issues and say, you should be a traditionalist and stay in the church because our doctrinal standards are not going to change. They're right, the doctrinal standards are not going to change, but when people violate them, there's also no enforcement mechanism either. So other than a bishop who takes care of that. Okay. How is the traditionalist response to the General Conference delay, the formation of the GMC, different in spirit from the prayerful disobedience of progressive bishops and churches? Um, the formation of the Global Methodist Church has the integrity of saying, we're breaking our ties and doing something different. The disobedience of progressive bishops is to have their cake and eat it too, to stay in the denomination uh, without any penalties. Uh, that's the difference to me, is if you can't follow a church's rules when you've sworn a sacred vow to uphold them, then you need to do something different, and that's what they're doing. Is there a discernment disaffiliation by the end of 22 versus May of 23? Is there any urgency? I think I addressed that. Um, I'll say the other factor besides 
paying next year's apportionments and the fact that we think the rules will not change between now and May. There are people who are on the conservative side of things that have come to trust my leadership and they get very nervous if a more progressive bishop follows me January 1st. I don't think that's a serious problem because I think the next bishop is going to enforce the conference policies that have been set by the conference. But that's a talking point that if somebody's going to ask the question, you ought to be aware of. Oh, you've got two more. Okay. Is there anything in the Articles of Religion about gay marriage or clergy? Uh, no. The Articles of Religion were formulated by John Wesley based on the Book of Common Prayer and the Church of England's 39 Articles. And the idea of uh, homosexual practice being validated was so uh, not, not even something to be considered that the Articles of Religion did not address them at all. They really go back in formulation to the 16th century and then Wesley's 18th century editing. Why we must leave if we vote to disaffiliate? We built this church. Um, I don't know if you mean by building this particular local church or if you built the whole denomination and the Texas Annual Conference and Lakeview and all those things. Uh, where we have ended up, friends, in this disaffiliation is to privilege local churches and to create a pathway for the local church to leave with its buildings and all of its assets and a minor sort of pay your bills before you go kind of thing. Um, I'm a fourth generation Methodist preacher. Uh, you know, I've spent my whole ministry trying to revitalize and strengthen our denomination. I believe in our doctrine. I really, I, I signed up as a bishop because I wanted to strengthen all of our churches, reach new people for Christ, uh, address important justice issues in our communities. Um, this is what I've given my life to. So when you say we built this church, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the church I love that formed me, that shaped me, that my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather served. Um, and it's going to be very, very different going forward. Uh, the pain here is just incredible. Uh, I know that's true for many of you as well. Uh, some of you all are lifelong cradle Methodists. Uh, some of you are newcomers who thought you had found a home and then discovered that, you know, the home's on fire or whatever the metaphor is. Uh, and yet, this is what it is. Here's the other thing to say. While I've been, uh, I go back to all those Methodist churches, my, my great-grandfather was in what was called the German Annual Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church. He was a Yankee. Well, an immigrant from Germany, but then a Yankee. Uh, then the, my father was born into the Methodist Church. He was a delegate in 1968 at the General Conference that formed the United Methodist Church. And so whatever my grandchildren end up is, they're likely to be Methodists. Global? United? I don't know. It's just a new iteration, a new name of the Wesleyan movement. In 2016, I wrote a book entitled The Once and Future Wesleyan Movement. I'm getting ready to reread it because, quite frankly, I said some things that I'm now finding myself repeating over and over again. Our church has accumulated some baggage. We need to leave it behind. I tried really hard in 2008 and 2012 to get rid of some of that baggage. It didn't work. Change was hard. Now we're looking at change. And I hope that God will use this crazy period of time we're in so that both the Global Methodist Church and the United Methodist Church emerge from this as strong and healthy as they possibly can be. I want to pray for us, and then I will stay up front if there are private questions. Are there more questions you have, Henry? Okay. I was just trying to wind it up and bring it to a close, but... Uh, 
As, as Mary Lou can tell you, I can talk for a long time on this stuff. Will the GMC be able to hold accountable progressive, uh, hold accountable progressive movement that might arise within the GMC? They have written uh, uh, rules for accountability in their denomination that are clean and easily enforced. Uh, partly getting rid of some of this baggage like jurisdictions. I started advocating to get rid of jurisdictions in 1997. Uh, it hadn't worked. Uh, and so the accountability processes, now, uh, John Stevens is saying, we're working on new accountability procedures. It's just that I haven't seen the details and don't think they'll pass. Do we know who the new bishop will be? Well, let me tell you how that works. There is a jurisdictional conference. We're hosting it on, on the west side of Houston in November, two to five. Uh, there are 204 voting delegates. Right now, people are nominating candidates to be considered. There will be interviews that night. They're going to elect three bishops. There are two of us who are retiring and one who's already retired, so there are three vacancies right now. Um, they start voting. You have to get 60% of the votes in order to be elected bishop. Once they've elected three bishops, the Episcopacy Committee for the jurisdiction goes into a room. Uh, they interview the new bishops. They've already interviewed the existing bishops. And uh, they begin talking, OK, which bishop ought to be assigned to which conference? Imagine Mary Lou and me in 2004. I was a tenured faculty member at SMU. Uh, the committee goes into a room, and you don't know where you're going. Uh, it's sort of like I do with preachers, you know. I tell them where to go. Well, this committee tells bishops where to go. And so we don't know who will be elected, whether we'll be getting here in Houston a rookie bishop, one of the three new ones, or whether we'll get one of the experienced ones who's serving elsewhere. Uh, now, in 2004, the bishop in Kansas had just been retired. Uh, Mary Lou's company was headquartered in Kansas. We were hoping. But the bishop in Missouri had also retired. And I don't know what you know about Jayhawks and Missouri Tigers, but the kids said, if you get assigned to Missouri, we're not coming to your place for Christmas. Um, so the committee, when they made their announcement, were reading out the names, and the very last name was Scott Jones to Kansas. Everybody in my family was applauding wildly at that point. Uh, same thing happened to me in 2012. Uh, they elected two new bishops that year. Uh, Houston, Bishop Huey had just retired. Uh, we knew that Oklahoma City was open. We knew that uh, Columbia, Missouri was open again. Ooh. Um, and San Antonio was open. And the committee comes out of the room and says, Scott and Mary Lou, you're moving to Houston. And like any good Methodist preacher, we said, thank you very much. We'll pack. How will churches provide input in the formation of the Global Methodist Church? Um, the Global Methodist Church will hold its convening general conference sometime. When I last talked to the president of their leadership council, he was expecting it to be in late 2024. Every church that belongs to the Global Methodist Church will be able to elect a representative to be a voting member of that general conference. They have this transitional book of doctrines and disciplines that's there and presumably will form the framework and not be changed too radically, but it will be affirmed or edited when that general conference begins. Uh, I'm told that the churches in our region that go to the Global Methodist Church will hold their first annual conference this January. Uh, I'm not involved in that process, but I told you about Bert Palmer, and he sent me an email and said that that was the plan that they were working on, so that there would be a regional gathering of churches with giving input and all that sort of thing. Uh, in the same way that uh, our Texas conference has input into what the general conference does, uh, 
churches that form the Global Methodist Church will have input into that convening general conference. Friends, thank you for your attention tonight. I think we've run out of questions at this point. I will stay down front if you want to come visit with me uh, privately, or if you want to send me an email, I'm happy to share with you my perspectives. God bless you. Let me pray, and then we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you for all the blessings you have poured out on the Methodist movement for the last 230 years. God, you've blessed us richly, and now as we face difficult times, help us navigate these waters with faith, with hope, with love. Help us focus on how we can best serve Christ in our mission field, and then give us the courage to step forward boldly. All this we ask in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Good night.